Have you ever had anyone ever misquote something that you said? Have you ever had to say, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. We attribute sayings like, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down that cherry tree to George Washington. But apparently the US, former U.S. president would be the very first to say, I never said that. And historians would agree. Likewise, it's believed that Paul Revere most likely never uttered the words, the British are coming, the British are coming. And Mark Twain, I believe, would be very amused to learn that we attribute to him the saying, two things in life are certain, death and taxes. Yeah, nope, that was not a saying of Mark Twain. In our world today, with its mass communication capabilities, people can often misquote others with alarming unaccountability. People can even misquote Jesus. Hmm. On more than one occasion, I've heard Jesus misquoted. Usually it's from people who claim to be Christians but seem intent on causing divisiveness or even ostracizing others who are not like them. I wonder how often Jesus would stand up and say, I never said that. In his very compelling book, Misquoting Jesus, author and biblical scholar Bert Ehrman made what he claims is a very disturbing discovery when he began to study the texts of the Bible in the original languages. And he claims he found a multitude of inconsistencies and intentional alterations that earlier translators had made over the centuries. So, as we continue our study, the sayings of Jesus, we approach his words with an awareness. An awareness that people often misquote Jesus, and that even renowned biblical scholars have argued for years and years, unable to agree on what Jesus did or did not say when he was quoted in the Bible. Regardless, as a matter of faith for me, what is of greater importance is discovering what these sayings of Jesus mean for my life today and how I might apply these transformative and powerful sayings of Jesus to my ongoing faith journey. Let us remember that as Easter people, we believe that God, through Christ, can transform our lives and that God is all-powerful, even more powerful than death itself. We affirm that a God who is capable of creating all life is certainly capable of resurrecting any and all life. And as Christians, we believe that the risen Christ is evidence of God's power, God's omnipotence. And God does not choose to use God's power to punish or to seek revenge for any perceived wrongdoings. Now, those who encountered the risen Lord, they weren't admonished with sayings from the risen Lord like, I'm resurrected, I told you so, right? Jesus didn't say, I'm back and now I'm going to get even. No, what we know instead is that the risen Lord offered words of peace, shalom. My friends, the power of God is grace, not revenge. The power of God is love, not hatred or divisiveness. The power of God is peace, shalom. Three days after the mortal remains of Jesus could not be found in that tombed burial site, the risen Lord appeared to frighten followers who had locked themselves behind closed doors for fear that they too would be taken away and put on a cross. And when he, when he showed up behind those locked doors, he offered words of grace, of love, a peace of shalom. Not long after that appearance, the risen Lord showed up again, this time by the Sea of Tiberias, as Simon Peter, one of the disciples, Simon Peter, and a few others labored catching fish. 
And I have to wonder if by this time it was Simon Peter, not Thomas, who was doubting as he contemplated, not quite sure what to make of all that had happened in his own faith journey. Perhaps he even recalled how years before he had left his fishing nets, the very nets he was using that day, that he had left those nets on the seashore to follow Jesus. He had experienced Jesus inviting him to join the movement, and Jesus had even changed his name from Simon to Peter, Petros, which means rock, because Jesus firmly believed that Simon was strong and stable and solid like a rock. But then, all of a sudden, things turned sour. Jesus was arrested, and, and Peter the rock got scared. And on that faithful night, he denied his Lord, not once, not twice, but three times. The next day, Jesus was was nailed to the cross, and Simon Peter had to feel not only saddened, but shattered, defeated. However, on that first Easter morning, I imagine Peter then had to feel excitement and gratitude over Christ's resurrection, and yet he was confused about his own life. Peter returned to Galilee he returned with his friends and he literally began to wait. In the absence of Jesus, he began to wait for some kind of sign, some kind of direction from God. He waited. Anything would suffice, but nothing, nothing happened. So I can imagine in his frustration and his impatience, he says, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going fishing. And I imagine in his head he's thinking, I can't just sit here and do anything. It's drive, do nothing. It's just driving me mad. I have to do something. And, and so they all get up and they head out and they go to fish. They fish all day and they fish all evening and they fish all night, but no luck. Finally, as dawn breaks, someone notices somebody standing out on the shoreline who instructs them by calling out, cast your nets on the right side of the boat. Figuring they have nothing to lose, they obeyed the stranger and they, they bring in this huge, huge catch of large fish. Then one of the disciples points to the figure on shore and turns to Peter and says, it's the risen Lord standing on shore. Peter, in his impulsiveness and in his excitement, literally jumps out of the boat, dives into the water, and quickly begins to, to make it to shore, swimming, as the others follow behind in the boat. And as they all arrive on shore, they discover the risen Lord is cooking them breakfast over an open fire on the beach, on the shore. So these physically hungry, these spiritually hungry fishermen sat and ate fish and bread with their risen Lord. John's Gospel in the 21st chapter, verse 14, picks up the story at this point. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And we can only presume he might have been pointing to fish, okay? Okay. And Peter said to him, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to Jesus, well, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, by now, Peter felt hurt because Jesus had said to him a third time, do you love me? And so he replied, well, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, 
you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Now, I really appreciate how the story reveals in a very grace-filled manner, literally the reversal of the three times Peter denied Jesus. In this account, Jesus provided three opportunities for Peter to embrace the command to care for others and to follow the example of how Jesus treated others with grace and love and peace. Shalom. Then the story ends. This is what's really remarkable. I love this story. It ends exactly the way it had begun years before. With Christ saying to Simon on the seashore these words, follow me. Follow me. Isn't that a great story? I mean, when you think about it, it is just jam-packed with the stuff of life, powerful symbols, strong emotions, and, and dramatic lessons. This is a, a story that has a very real human quality to it. And more importantly, with the life and ministry of Jesus drawing to a dr very dramatic close, it appears to ask the question of those of us who remain, what does the Lord want us to do? What does the Lord want us to do? What does it mean to exactly to feed sheep and tend sheep and feed lambs? What does that really mean? for us in the 21st century. We live in such a secularized world, such a, such a polarized world, less religious and much more materialistic. It's been happening for quite a while. You know, there was a time when we Christians took it for granted that the spread of Christianity around the world faced no real earthly challenge. But today we have a very different perspective, don't we? As time marches on, there is a great challenge facing the church. Our world continues to be saturated like never before with a wide variety of beliefs, theological, philosophical, political, scientific. And that's not bad, but just a growing, growing variety of beliefs and disbeliefs and quotes and misquotes. And there's also the challenge in North America, here in the United States, where every mainline major denomination is shrinking in membership and attendance. Baptists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, United Methodists, to name a few, with each passing year, literally hundreds of churches permanently close their doors each year for the very last time. And the future doesn't look very promising. So why, why has this shift from growth to decline occurred? I believe it's because the church has lost its way. I believe that the church has lost its way, and for at least the last two generations, if not more, our churches have stopped focusing on the lambs and the sheep of the world and have begun just slowly over time worrying solely on tending to the flock within, within the walls of any local church. I think for decades Christians have mistaken the sayings of Jesus as meant for the clergy. You're ordained, you're the pastor. Jesus is saying to you, Pastor, take care of those who have just become Christians. Take care of those who have been Christians for years and years. Build lots of buildings, create lots of programs, hire lots of people to take care of the flock within the walls. So many churches took on the notion that they were the lambs and the sheep to be fed. And so each Sunday they would come to worship and like lambs and sheep, they would sort of graze on what was offered. Oh, I like this hymn a little bit. 
that prayer sort of fed me. I'll nibble a little bit at his sermon that he's preaching. And you know, I've been, a, I've been a lay person much longer than I've been a pastor. I am just as guilty. We graze because we feel like our spiritual bellies are full. Meanwhile, on the outside are lambs and sheep with empty bellies, starving for a word of grace, ready to devour any morsel of hope and certainly thirsting for the very truth of God. You know, it was made very clear to the disciples, even before Jesus died, it was made very clear what they were supposed to do. (laughs) But even even Thomas and Simon Peter and the others, they went back to the comfortable rather than what they were called to do. They returned to fishing for fish rather than fishing for people. And I think just like Peter, a lot of Christians today, I mean a lot of Christians today, no longer fish for people. They too have returned to the comfortable. And once this inwardly focused on self became the norm, it resulted in this downward spiraling of congregations toward eventual distinct extinction. It's happening to so many churches. And there are a lot of people who study this phenomena, and those who study it believe it's been happening at least since the 1950s. This downward spiral. However, there is good news. There's really good news. Most of the churches that have reversed this trend and have begun to grow in the last few decades have realized that this message, this saying of Jesus, is intended for all Christians. The church, the people in the church, the body of Christ, are to care for the sheep and lambs who are in the world. And the church must always balance itself between being inwardly focused and outwardly focused. We care for one another within the body of Christ, of course we do, but equally, if not more so, we focus on those outside the body as well those in our neighborhoods, in our communities that surround each and every church in North America. You know, we worship on an average here at Wesley, uh, between this site with our many services in downtown, we have about a thousand people pass through here each Sunday. We have nearly double that in our membership. And so we could well spend all of our time and all of our talents and all of our resources focused inwardly on ourselves. It wouldn't be that hard to keep that busy. That being said, how will we choose to feed spiritually hungry lambs and sheep in our community as we follow Jesus Christ? Well, we've heard this morning already one way that we can do that, to engage in our mission blitz on Saturday, May 7th. We're going to reach out and partner with other, uh, others in our community, churches and organizations to offer a phenomenal experience for those who are in need in our community. With its theme, Hope Starts Here, we will provide things like medical care, dental care, food, joy-filled experiences for families, for children, and so much more. And so I want to encourage all of us to participate in this very exciting community event. If you didn't know it, we have a wonderful garden out here on our lot now that we've begun this year, and it's a community garden. It also provides a way for us to reach out to our community, to our neighbors, and and build relationships and connect others with the love of Christ as we all come together and we literally grow food in order to feed others who are hungry in our community. Then we had our amazing event out on the lawn the day before Easter. If you missed it, it was spectacular. We had all kinds of things. We were the host, but we were doing it for our community, for the children and families that live around our church. Hundreds of people came that day. It was a way for us to be the hands and feet and heart of Jesus. Last but certainly not least, Ted Madden heads up our mission and outreach efforts. 
providing us so many opportunities to care for others through phenomenal programs like Ozark Food Harvest, Harmony House, Rare Breed, Well of Life Food Pantry, our partnership with York and, and Campbell Elementary School, and we offer so much more. Opportunities where we can offer the love of Christ in our community and well beyond. And so here's the invitation this morning. My invitation to all of us is to discover a way to spiritually feed others in a non-threatening, grace-filled way. And I, I encourage you to pray about a way to serve. There are just so many ways to serve. Jesus invites us to, to tend the lambs and to feed the sheep. And that means the vulnerable, hungry, the poor human beings who have yet to experience the peace and the shalom of Christ in their lives. Jesus asked Peter a very important question. He asked Peter, Do you love me? A theologian, Gary Jones, expresses it this way. In the end, perhaps the risen Lord offers the Peter in each of us still another way to recognize and encounter the divine in the day-to-day as the Lord tells the disciples three times to feed his sheep. It is as if our denials of God are somehow redeemed by our loving encounters with God in the hungry and the poor. Feeding the Lord's sheep is a tangible way of staying in relationship with the Lord as well as the surest way to express our love for him, not only with our lips, but in our lives. May we always consider it an honor and a privilege to tend to and feed others in Christ's name. Amen.